What I'm going to do is walk through kind of the irregular threat to the U.S. homeland that comes from a range of foreign actors, particularly the Russians and the Chinese. Happy to talk in addition about the Iranians. Uh, we're going to run out of time, I think, on Iran and my remarks, but happy to take any questions uh, along those lines. So this subject, I think, is incredibly important. Let me just kind of outline the way I've designed this. So uh, there is a wonderful story that the British theorist and military historian B.H. Littlehart uh, tells of uh, the Irish statesman John Wilson Croker. And he is taking a walk through the English country, countryside with the first Duke of Wellington. And they are passing time as they're walking, trying to guess what is on the other side of every hill uh, that, uh, that they're walking near. And Croker expresses surprise, actually, awe, really, at Wellington's ability to tell him what is on the other side of every hill. And so the first Duke of Wellington responds why, and says, why I have spent my entire life in trying to guess what is at the other side of the hill. Uh, and then he proceeds to expand on that comment by saying that it is the definition of an imaginative general or policymaker uh, in our case, in the wider sense of, of trying to understand and guess what is happening at the other side of the hill, behind the opposing front and in the opposing mind. So what I'm going to do here, and this is the most recent book that I've written, is it's a look at how the Russians, the Chinese, and the Iranians view competition with the United States. But how do, they, how do they view us? How do they think about competing? And then for our program, for CHDS, really what is the impact on the homeland? And, and how do we think about competition a, a, as it impacts the homeland? And, and you know, this, it was interesting. The, uh, uh, the way I went about this was several fold. One is uh, spent a large amount of time and money for that matter, translating large amounts of documents, strategic documents, uh, major speeches from uh, senior Chinese, Russian, Iranian leaders and other strategic documents, uh, the science of military strategy, China's basically quintessential strategic competition document. Um, and then interviewing a range of individuals with direct or indirect knowledge of the actions of uh, these countries. In addition, I also spent a, a lot of time, as we'll see in a moment, interviewing senior leaders. But at the core of the argument is that, that while it is certainly important to build conventional and, and even nuclear strategic capabilities, uh, we are primarily focused on those kinds of capabilities from these countries. So we focus a lot on uh, Russian invasion of the Baltics, or now in Ukraine, a conventional invasion, a lot on uh, a conventional Chinese invasion of Taiwan. But the challenge here, at least in, in, in uh, when it comes to direct activity against the United States, there are some huge challenges, costs, really, because the U.S. has uh, nuclear weapons, so do the Russians, so do the Chinese. So as we saw during the Cold War, during the Cuban Missile Crisis, when both countries nearly came to blows following the US blockade of Cuba after nuclear missiles were identified by US U-2s, uh, and there was a potential escalation to conventional and even nuclear war, both Moscow and Washington paused at the precipice, at the, at the edge of the abyss. And what, what members of both administrations, both the US and the Soviets, recognized, rightly so, is that when, when both sides have nuclear weapons, even conventional war has the ability to escalate to major destruction. So when we look at some of the war games, uh, war in this case with China here, 
there can be notable impacts on uh, the populations that are killed in strikes, conventional or nuclear, uh, the economies being significantly impacted by, uh, including the GDPs by nuclear war. And so what it does is these barriers really push competition from a day-to-day -day basis down to the regular level. So what do we mean by irregular in this context? Uh, we mean the competition below the threshold of, nu of nuclear conventional war. So below the threshold of set piece battles on some kind of a physical battlefield. The goal of these states in, in, uh, in this case, we're talk mostly about Moscow and Beijing is still to expand their power and influence and to weaken the US and its allies. But it's not to do it in general because the costs are so high on battlefields to fight the US in some kind of a full the gap scenario, the way we saw the uh, NATO and Warsaw Pact prepared to fight each other on, in the intra-German area during the Cold War, or some kind of battle of midway that we saw during World War II, huge navies and, and aircraft fighting each other in essentially pitched battles. With nuclear weapons, it changes the dynamics significantly. So instead, the attempt to uh, expand one's power and influence and weaken the adversary uh, comes through other means below that threshold, information, disinformation, psychological operations. So what I'm calling here information campaigns, support to state and non-state partners so that they can actually conduct uh, the actions instead of, of you. So you're not directly fighting uh, a range of covert action, including cyber operations, and then various aspects of economic coercion. So in that sense, uh, these are the main elements of irregular operations and the main areas that we will talk about with the Russians and the Chinese. The terms these kinds of countries use vary somewhat. And if we're, if we're looking on the other side of the hill, it's appropriate that we use the definitions that they do. The Russians have, have uh, spent considerable time really perfecting what they call active measures or, uh, uh, or denial and deception, maskarovka. These are, these are aspects of during the Cold War weakening the US through covert instruments. Uh, during that period, it was service A of the KGB, significant disinformation campaigns, meddling in US elections, those kinds of activities. The Iranians have terms like soft war, jung i -narm, and the Chinese have uh, various concepts like Dao Zheng, which is struggle. Um, and they use it in explaining competition with the US. They also have an important term called San Zhong Zhanfa, or three warfares. Now, note, by the way, that, that, uh, that when these countries generally use the term warfare in this context, it's not being used in, if, if you go back to your undergraduate school days, if you read any of the Prussian military theorist Karl von Clausewitz, it's not really a Clausewitzian definition of warfare where it's really uh, kinetic activity or solely kinetic activity. Warfare here is much more about weakening your adversaries, and it can be a huge component of it is non-kinetic, that is, the not, not using uh, bombs or guns uh, to do that. So the three warfares that China gives us and are an important part of its competition are in, include legal warfare, media or public relations warfare, and then finally psychological warfare. None of those, literally zero of the, those involved uh, dropping bombs, uh, using guns, they are, they are non-kinetic ways to weaken adversaries. So public and media relations is all the state-run media and some of the covert activity that the Chinese are involved in, as well as the lawfare, legal warfare component. One useful example of that is the dispute over the islands and the Spratleys in the South China Sea 
Uh, Philippines, for example, took the Chinese to court over China's um, uh, taking over the atolls, which we'll show some satellite imagery uh, shortly. Uh, the Hague in the Netherlands ruled against China and in favor of the Philippines. And China's response essentially was, we do not recognize the legal authority of the Hague. And so in that sense, it was that it was a it was an example of lawfare. It was, a, it was a waging legal warfare against the West, not recognizing those institutions as even legitimate. So these are all examples of how they perceive this. And I think what's what's really important, however one thinks about these issues, is it wasn't really a surprise to me, but the closer I looked, these countries all essentially view us as their primary competitors, adversaries, uh, ones that, uh, that have a very different political, economic, cultural system. That doesn't mean there, there's no avenue or possibility for cooperation, but it does mean that as Beijing and Moscow, for example, look at the current international order and they look at the West that supports uh, democracy, the, the really the ability to choose leaders, the ability to to uh, uh, have a free and independent press, to have freedom of religion. These, these are anathema to all of these countries. In, in none of them do we see uh, individuals able to choose their leaders, certainly not at the top. So there's no democracy. There's also, there's also no freedom of expression, freedom of, of, uh, of ideas. They all have state-run media, state-run internet, and digital platforms. Uh, in fact, as we've seen even in the last several months, the Chinese have tracked down uh, Chinese individuals, diaspora populations across the globe for criticizing the government in any way, shape or form, including on digital platforms. So uh, really very different competitive political, economic and other systems. Uh, they are not uh, capitalist. Uh, the Chinese have some elements of capitalism but again, we see very competitive systems. So I'm not gonna talk a lot about uh, how kind of I did this, uh, including in the book. A lot of it was done through uh, three senior officials in each of these countries, which give us kind of a flavor of how they think. I mean, happy to take questions on any of them. On the left, we see Valery Gerasimov, the chief of the army staff. He's been important in Russia's current operations in Ukraine. Uh, we see Zhang Zhao, the uh, vice chairman of the, of the CMC, China's chief military body, and then the now deceased Qasem Soleimani, and then also his predecessor, Ismail Khani, uh, the head of the uh, uh, Islamic Revolutionary Guards Quds Force, which is really the primary regular arm of the Iranian government. So let me start with the Russians. Uh, they're in the front page today. Russian objectives today, as, as we can see, frankly, from Putin's remarks even yesterday and his statements over the last couple of weeks and months, is really to attempt to expand Russian power and influence in ways that uh, are trying to make up for the loss of Russian power and influence with the collapse of the Soviet Union and the uh, uh, loss of the Warsaw Pact. So all of the countries, Poland, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Romania, which were all in the Soviet sphere of influence, not only, of course, did the Soviets lose their former republics, uh, which many of them went to NATO and the European Union, but they lost their sphere of influence in Eastern Europe. So part of the objective today is to claw as much of that back as they can. As they can. And the primary tool we have seen them use is irregular. Uh, for the most part, we don't see a huge focus on Russian conventional operations, particularly against the United States. Ukraine is a bit of an outlier, although even there we've seen them mostly operating uh, in a regular fashion. And, and I'll come back to that in, uh, in a little bit when we get to Ukraine. Uh, but we've seen them use cyber operations, uh, offensive cyber espionage, and a range of other covert action, including directed at the uh, U.S. homeland. So uh, Gerasimov's focus 
has been a heavy emphasis on irregular operations to weaken the US. So let me take a couple of these examples in a moment uh, in successively. So when we look at the Russian taking of Crimea uh, about a decade ago, the way they did it was primarily classic uh, irregular. So if Sun Tzu, if Clausewitz is the quintessential example of kinetic operations, then Sun Tzu is the, the Chinese philosopher, military theorist, and, and general Sun Tzu talks about uh, winning without fighting. And so this is what the Russians did in Crimea. They deployed Spetsnaz and other Russian, generally special operations and intelligence units into Crimea to retake the territory without firing a shot. They conducted a heavy information disinformation campaign and, uh, and then uh, overthrew uh, Crimea, including the uh, mayor of Sevastopol and inserted a pro-Russian leader and then annexed it and annexed it into uh, Russian territory where it sits today. In Ukraine in, in 2014, instead of uh, a conventional invasion, we saw the Russians essentially provide assistance to pro-Russian rebels or insurgents. Uh, they supplied weapons to them. They conducted a he heavy disinformation campaign inside of Ukraine. Uh, and so instead of conducting most of that military action with irregular units, uh, we have seen uh, a heavy focus on irregular operations. And then in Syria, same kinds of activities. Starting in 2015, the focus of Russian activity uh, was primarily irregular. So the Russians did drop some bombs from aircraft, uh, fixed wing aircraft and shot caliber cruise missiles from Russian maritime vessels. But the primary focus has been irregular units. So who are the maneuver elements in key cities like Aleppo in Syria? Lebanese Hezbollah, a US designated terrorist organization. Militias that the Iranians trained from Palestinian territory, from Iraq, the Hashid al-Shabi, from Afghanistan and Pakistan, the Zenabayoun, for example. These were militia forces that were used, irregular units that were used to retake territory, in some cases with some cooperation with Syrian, Syrian units on the ground. But again, heavy Russian focus on irregular or hybrid operations. We've also seen uh, Russian intelligence services both the main intelligence directorate or GRU, as well as the SVR, Russia's Foreign Intelligence Agency, heavily focused on black energy, in destroyer, gray energy, including offensive cyber attacks, some of which I'm sure that Elvis will talk a little bit more detail about next, including NotPetya, uh, which, which exploded well beyond Ukraine and conducted uh, targeted activity focused on US companies and others throughout the, the West. So what's interesting here is one of the few countries we've seen really turn the lights out in Ukrainian cities, even for a brief period of, of time uh, using offensive cyber operations. It really is a, an extraordinary example of the lethality, the possible lethality of offensive cyber operations. And again, Russians really at the cutting edge of not just having the capability, but also using it as a component of warfare. We've also seen, I, I don't want to step on Elvis's toes too much, but we've used, we've seen the use of non-state Russian actors, including those that have operated in part from Russian territory, conduct attacks like Colonial Pipeline uh, in the US, which for any of us on the East Coast, certainly impacted our ability to get gas during those few days. I mean, I was impacted directly. Struggled at one point early on in the crisis. I think I was 0 for 9 in finding a gas station that had, uh, that had gas. The 10th one was a two hour wait in Old Town, Alexandria, but it was a pretty tough slog for a few days until uh, the US got the pipeline back up as a ransomware attack and uh, the uh, Colonial Pipeline turned back the uh, pipeline system on 
uh, oil started to flow through and trucks could then uh, transport uh, gas, for example, to, uh, to gas stations across the mid-Atlantic of the United States. But we've also seen uh, attacks against uh, pl plenty of other organizations. I've been the recipient of multiple SVR and GRU phishing attacks directly for, frankly, for this book and plenty of other things that have been done, but they've been pretty aggressive at uh, targeting me and, and many others that have been critical of, of the Russians. So they've been, been they, and, and they planted malware, frankly, as, as most of you know, planted malware in the US uh, critical infrastructure in, in the, the US homeland. Uh, in addition, and I'll, I'll talk about Ukraine in a moment, we see a lot of Russian expansion overseas using private military companies. Many of these are the Wagner Group, uh, which is at least uh, partially owned by Yevgeny Prigozhin, a close friend of Vladimir Putin. So here we don't see a huge deployment of Russian regular conventional forces overseas to expand influence, but a lot of Russian irregular activities through private military companies. They coordinate though uh, pretty closely with GRU, Military Intelligence Directorate, as well as SVR, uh, Russian, Intelli Russian Foreign Intelligence in all of these countries. One of the more interesting recent cases is Mali, where the French have withdrawn uh, most of their counterterrorism footprint in, in the Sahel in Mali, and uh, the Russians have moved in. Um, so, uh, you know, kind of an interesting, irregular movement. In addition, probably not surprising that uh, these private military companies with direct Russian involvement have, uh, have also been involved in offensive military operations, fixed wing aircraft, tanks, armed personnel carriers, artillery strikes. In addition, intelligence collection. In addition, they've been involved in site security and also a lot of extraction of mineral resources again, through plausible, deniable means, quasi-deniable means. So you're starting to get the picture here that a lot of Russian activity overseas, uh, including in the US homeland, but through quasi-deniable means, ways at least that Moscow can say, this is not us, or these aren't our regular units. We don't know who this is. Uh, technically, private military companies in Russia are actually illegal. Yet we know from significant U.S. Uh, uh, public acknowledgement by the U.S. intelligence community and, and Treasury, which has sanctioned a number of these countries, that they have very close relationship with Russian military and Russian intelligence. So just to touch base on, on uh, a lot of what we're seeing today, and then we can talk more about this in a moment. Um, you know, my, there certainly is a conventional component to uh, to the war we're seeing in Ukraine. Uh, this is as of a couple of days ago. Obviously, we've seen some of those ground forces, the red red kegels, move into the Donetsk and the Luhansk areas. Uh, there's still a force presence of about 190,000 Russian uh, regular and irregular units in and around uh, Ukraine. So in Belarus, still in in Russia, still. Uh, in the Black Sea, about 40 combat ships in the Black Sea, about 500 combat aircraft within striking distance of Ukraine. And then, uh, and then in addition, about another 50,000 or so Belarusian forces. But we've definitely seen a lot of irregular activity. In fact, that's what we're seeing. Uh, that's what we've seen for the most part the last few days. It's a lot of heavy shelling by uh, Russian-backed insurgents rebels in Ukraine. We now see some limited Russian uh, regular forces in, in the east of the country. But we've also seen a heavy focus on offensive cyber operations. Um, I don't see a high likelihood, particularly because the US is not going to deploy combat forces into Ukraine of direct US-Russian combat. I mean, that goes back to that initial comment I made, it does, that risks escalation to conventional and nuclear war. I don't think either Moscow or Washington wants this. However, uh, we are in danger of escalating in the irregular arena. Uh, so let's just think second and third order effects here of, of the US.
Russians have conducted very limited, the U.S. has conducted very limited um, sanctions now against uh, Donetsk and Luhansk, but limited amounts against Moscow. That could obviously change very quickly where we start to see escalation in U.S. sanctions, including against microelectronic imports or potentially SWIFT, uh, uh, Russian, you know, in, in targeting the Russian banking system. We've already seen the Russians uh, look for support from the Chinese to uh, allay some of the concerns from US sanctions. Uh, we've also seen uh, the Russians start to look at other kinds of irregular actions against the US, cyber attacks against US companies. I mean, I've talked to several banks recently, the chief security officers, very concerned about Russian operations. They, are, they can be extremely aggressive at uh, conducting operations that wipe out uh, computers uh, with malware planted on services, uh, on, on servers. Uh, they've, there's also the possibility of other kinds of irregular operations. Folks may remember a couple of weeks ago, there were Russian military ships uh, parked off the coast of Ireland. Uh, I know US and other NATO officials uh, were very cognizant that these Russian maritime vessels were parked right near the fiber optic cables that go underneath the Atlantic and connect North America and Europe uh, with all fiber optic uh, networks. It's a huge vulnerability. And we've already seen in areas around, uh, around Svalbard off the coast of Norway, uh, the Russians have cut, uh, they've been repaired, but had cut uh, cut, essentially using irregular means, cut fiber optic cables. So we're seeing the potential for escalation uh, in the irregular uh, arena between the US and the Russians that could absolutely impact the whole month. I'm happy to get into a little bit more uh, details along those lines, but um, very, very concerning if there is escalation on, on this front. Uh, a lot of the focus, we've been doing a lot of satellite imagery of uh, activity. This was um, Russian-backed rebel forces, main battle tanks, self-propelled artillery. I mean, there's a lot of ways this conflict can continue to migrate. We'll continue to watch. It's one of the more interesting conflicts in recent memory because so much of it is, is open source uh, because there's so much commercially available information. And because the administration has also made the, I think, correct decision to uh, have so much of it open and in the public to declassify a range of intelligence. Let me just shift gears. So there's a lot on the Russian front. Let me just shift gears briefly to the Chinese and then I'll turn it back uh, and happy to go through whatever questions or comments folks have. Um, probably the, the first and mo most interesting thing on the Chinese is this is, you know, they've given us frankly the history of uh, irregular warfare through both Mao and Sun Tzu as examples. And the uh, Chinese uh, irregular operations probably quintessential, frankly, in um, Wolf Warrior Two. if you haven't seen it, worth watching. This is a Chinese special operator uh, operating against the US, the main enemy in, in uh, Africa. So not a Chinese infantryman, but a special operator operating in Africa, not in the Taiwan Straits, and who's the main enemy that they defeat and kill at the end? Yes, defeat and kill uh, is the Americans. So this is the second most watched movie in Chinese history. This is what this is what the Chinese are showing. This is the PLA uh, because the Communist Party runs the uh, uh, and the PLA in this case because it's a military film. Uh, Chinese Communist Party essentially runs uh, the movie industry. So this is, you know, it's a good example. We see a lot of Chinese activity in the Belt Road Initiative. I think what's important here is to understand that the Chinese use their economic leverage for political influence. We see that basically everywhere they're involved in the Belt and Road Initiative is using the significant infrastructure to gain leverage on issues of importance to China uh, either with how they vote in the UN, including the UN Security Council, or how they vote within their own legislatures on issues of importance, uh, the status of Taiwan, so one or two China policy, 
Tibet, Hong Kong, the, whether, whether they criticize China for genocide in Xinjiang province against the Uyghurs, all kinds of issues uh, that the Chinese have used for leverage. So once they give large amounts of economic assistance, they will then pressure those governments. So it's a form of economic coercion. If the useful example of, of uh, uh, the Russians is Crimea to take territory without uh, uh, shooting, without violence, without firing shot, the, uh, the, the Chinese equivalent is the South China Sea, Mischief Island, Gavin's Reef, Fiery Cross Reef, where they turned atolls overnight using dredgers, sand dredgers, into military bases with signals intelligence or SIGINT platforms uh, with, with, uh, uh, with, uh, with uh, electronic warfare, with missile, missile capabilities and uh, air defense systems, and with runways that they have uh, used for fixed wing fighter aircraft and strategic bombers as well. So these are bases uh, initially done under the auspices of helping Chinese fishermen in the South China Sea, now they've turned into military bases. Uh, obviously the homeland is a significant location for conducting offensive cyber attacks, useful. You know, one of the things the US does not do, everybody does espionage to some degree. Uh, the, what the US does not do is have a essentially symbiotic relationship with its private sector where it gives that information to its private sector to make it more competitive. We see the Chinese uh, heavily involved in handing that information to state-run businesses to make them more competitive in the military sphere, in artificial intelligence, nanotechnology, machine learning, in a range of other areas. And then, you know, we could go on forever uh, on, on, on other things. Let me just conclude really with kind of what is at stake. Let me just finish on this, which is Freedom House tells us that um, uh, there have been 15 consecutive years in a loss of democracy around the world, 15 straight years of authoritarian advancement. There is a lot at stake. So for the Chinese, the Russians, and even the Iranians, which we didn't get into much, this is a significant attempt to change the international order and the rules of that order, primarily through irregular means without having to fight the US directly in conventional battles. So I think with that, I will stop sharing and turn this over and see where we want to go on questions. Thank you, Seth. We have uh, a question. Can you comment on the reports that China, Russia, and North Korea have declared that they no longer consider HEMP used as a nuclear attack, but as cyber? So an EMP or non-nuclear EMP attack on other countries is now planned as first strike allowable in their views. I have seen that uh, reported in the press. What I cannot do entirely is confirm that that is how the, and, and the Chinese in particular are pretty ambiguous, uh, not particularly transparent in what they actually uh, believe. So they're pretty ambiguous in their nuclear policies. So what's less clear to me is how much that actually reflects uh, a Chinese decision and how much of that uh, is just uh, press reporting. So I, I would just say, David, in response, uh, I've seen those reports. Um, I mean, I will say this, that, uh, that I, I believe at the end of the day, uh, if North Korea, Russia, or China felt threatened and felt the survival was potentially at stake, they would conduct first use of nuclear weapons. Um, what's interesting in any of the war games I've been involved in, uh, let's say with Russia and China, a lot of those are or along the main, both mainlands in the South China Sea, as well as in the Baltic states. And as those conventional wars uh, you know, move along, what you'll often see is NATO countries, in part because it's getting targeted by missiles uh, coming from Russian territory or from Chinese territory, 
targeting U.S. ships in the Taiwan Straits. The U.S. responds to target those air defense systems and those missile silos, and so it hits targets in the Chinese mainland. Again, these are, or the Russian mainland, again, these are just war games. But those hits against, uh, against the Chinese and Russian mainland as part of a conventional war then have in war games, I, several war games I've been in, the red side, so that's either China or Russia, uh, cannot fully determine whether those strikes are done for defensive purposes to protect the ships in the Taiwan Straits or the, the ground forces in the Baltic states or whether they're offensive. And they're attempting now to overthrow the governments. So I think for those reasons, we've seen escalation first use uh, because those countries have felt threatened. So, so regardless of what they've actually declared, uh, I feel reasonably confident that um, uh, both Russia and China, and actually North Korea for that matter, would use would conduct a first use if they believed their security, sovereignty, survival was at stake. Another question. Understanding the motives of the U.S. and Russia over the Ukraine crisis is confusing. Some in the social psychological world think that the mutual misconceptions of mistrust could lead to a fundamental attribution error or mistakes that are made when we make attempts to attribute motives to other people's behavior. What checks and balances do we have to keep open channels to keep mutual misconceptions from occurring? Well, we do have a phone line that's been in place for several decades directly with the Kremlin. Uh, uh, between U.S. leaders and senior Russian leaders. And I think that continues to be very important. There also is a very close personal relationship, uh, and I've talked to both sides of this, uh, between senior U.S. and senior Russian military leaders, for example, between uh, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, and it's a longstanding historical relationship with uh, Valerie Gerasimov, Chief of the Army Staff, who I, I uh, put up a picture of him earlier. I talked to Milley about Gerasimov. I talked to his predecessor, uh, uh, General Dunford, uh, the former Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, about the Gerasimov relationship. Uh, they are regular, routine relationships. They speak regularly. And, and so I, I think there, there is, both sides have indicated um, that they are willing to uh, conduct actions. The U.S. has clearly signaled to the Russians that it will uh, impose sanctions and probably escalate. Uh, the U.S. has also indicated, as of other NATO countries, that they may uh, continue to provide military assistance to the Ukrainians. And the Russians have also uh, conducted, uh, you know, cyber operations against the Ukrainians. What we haven't seen a lot of is direct conflict or even indirect conflict uh, uh, that uh, impacts each other's forces. And that's where things may get dicey. Uh, for example, if U.S. or other NATO weapons systems are used, like let's say javelins, which, which the U.S. these are anti-tank missiles, are used to um, uh, to target a Russian tank, not a Russian-supported uh, tank, so Russian separatists, but an actual Russian tank with Russian regular soldiers inside. And that javelin kills Russian soldiers. That is indirectly a U.S. weapon system that the U.S. provided to the Ukrainians used to kill Russian soldiers. And that, I think, has the potential to escalate the situation. And so do the sanctions, frankly. Uh, we're, we're, we haven't seen a lot of escalatory sanctions yet. I, I think this is where it becomes important though for the US to continue pretty frank and open discussions with the Russians, uh, probably also include others, the Chinese, uh, in, those, in some of those discussions. Um, but there, there are possibilities for miscalculation. I mean, I think there is no question, especially if Russian soldiers start to, to die. It's, Putin's going to have a hard time explaining this to his population without uh, responding in that case. How do you see rebuilding the whole of nation planning and preparedness framework that necessarily includes all major private sector industry? How do we rebuild the nation's mobilization capacity for all hazards in the environment you described? 
Well, uh, I think there is a really important aspect of building resilience in our uh, critical infrastructure system. So, you know, it's interesting. I've spent a lot of time both uh, recently uh, at Scott Air Force Base, uh, tr U.S. Transportation Command, as well as uh, I, we hosted for a public forum the, the Transcom Commander in Washington. And I mean, even there, uh, the ability for uh, the U.S. to uh, even support its forces overseas, a lot of the, uh, uh, the flow and the mobility of U.S. military personnel, forces, equipment, uh, moves out of key locations in the U.S. Let's say the uh, 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 you know there are some key areas in the Carolinas where the U.S. Uh, Transcom moves out logistics. Well, they are extraordinarily vulnerable to uh, Russian subs. Uh, people aren't entirely aware. Russian subs have been parked off of both the west and east coasts of the United States. Uh, for partially symbolic purposes, but they do have the ability to strike and launch cruise missiles and ballistic missiles if they were to do that. I mean, we, US obviously has an ability to respond as well, but the US, the, the Russians have subs parked and have had subs parked just off of our West and East coasts. Uh, the, our entire critical infrastructure is vulnerable. I think one of the things that's interesting in looking at the Chinese threat to the homeland is it's, it's certainly concerning, but Russians have the ability to conduct uh, hypersonic strikes, uh, uh, cruise and ballistic missile strikes um, through the Arctic and to hit the U.S. homeland, then there are some vulnerabilities in homeland defense against incoming missiles. So there are a range of steps that the U.S. needs to continue to take to protect. So there's a defensive component to this. It's just to protect its critical infrastructure from cyber missile, space-based, and other threats. There also, frankly, is an offensive side of this. And that is, um, there is a continuing need, uh, you know, and think of this from a, uh, in the Cold War, we had mutually assured destruction or MAD. There is a need with a vulnerable homeland, uh, critical infrastructure, architecture. There is a need, and we don't generally talk a lot about this publicly, but there is a need to make sure that we have uh, capabilities to target the critical infrastructure of our adversaries. That means, I can say this, I'm not in government right now, planting malware and other, uh, other uh, conducting other activities in the critical infrastructure of China and of Russia and of other, that we have essentially the equivalent of what we call during the nuclear era, second strike capability. We've already talked about second strike and first strike, uh, we, we need to continue to have a second strike capability. With nuclear weapons, it's really having those weapons ability, you know, the capability to launch and strike targets. But in the cyber realm, uh, it's kind of a, of a cat and mouse game on identifying malware, disabling it, and then finding it, replanting it. So there, there is an ability, and this is on the space-based side as well, the ability to dazzle the other side's uh, space-based systems. Again, here, we're not talking about conducting actions per se, but having capability to do this and at least to demonstrate every once in a while to remind these countries that we do have the capability. Organizations like NSA do have the capability to conduct actions, uh, much like we saw the Russians in Ukraine. We have the capability to do that against adversaries. That is, I think, very important for a deterrent, for deterrence, uh, that at the very least, if someone is, is considering doing it to our homeland security architecture, that they are very clear that we have the ability to respond. That's what, at the end of the day, created some sense of stability in a mad, mutually assured destruction world during the Cold War. So that's the kind of the offensive side of this uh, as well. Curious, in the years and months leading up to this, did we see any active measures of local expansion into Ukraine from businesses or businessmen investing in the country? 
So uh, it, uh, I, I think I heard that was the, is the question, did we see a lot of uh, ac uh, examples of activity of investment in Ukraine? Is this, was, it, was that Russian? Yeah, so I was thinking more about from a passive approach, instead of invading, they could have taken time over the past couple of years to have sent in businesses or people to, to infiltrate, so to say. Did that occur or? There's a little bit of that, but where the Russians have spent most of their time uh, instead is frankly to attempt to back up what I call sort of polit a political opposition. So uh, as we talked a little bit about earlier in the slides, uh, they, the Russians backed um, Ukrainian rebels, some of them are Russian, uh, rebels in Eastern Ukraine in the, in the uh, Donbass, in the uh, Donetsk and Luhansk areas. Uh, so irregular units, <clears throat> they, Russians also supported uh, Russian and Ukrainian political leaders. So the uh, declassified intelligence earlier this year did identify uh, Russian attempts to uh, get rid of Zelensky and install in his place uh, a Russian-backed Ukrainian political leader. So that's been the primary focus of the uh, uh, of the Russian government is to undermine the political legitimacy of Zelensky and that pro-Western go uh, pro Ukrainian government uh, to build some military and paramilitary capabilities in the East, and then to conduct a pretty heavy information, disinformation, psychological operations campaign uh, talking about, I mean, just think for a moment about how the Russians conducted operations in, in, uh, in the US during previous elections. Uh, they, they did this kind of on steroids in Ukraine. Uh, so Zelensky was labeled and, and several Ukrainian leaders in a heavy disinformation campaign as corrupt, illegitimate. Uh, it was a lot of stuff that was either dug up or even made up about him and about senior Ukrainian leaders. Lots of stuff about the, the joint history of uh, Ukraine and Russia, that they really are one country. That's really where uh, the Russians focused as opposed to kind of the economic side that you're talking about. Might have been, I mean, it would have been an interesting way to do it, but that's not where they spent most of their time, effort, and, uh, and activity. All right, we have time for one more question. Greg Favor on Zoom, go ahead. Um, I, I won't ask you to, to dive into the federal budget completely, but if we were to invest uh, over the next five years, what would, what, would be your, what would be your principal purchase or investment over the next five to seven years relative to, to some of these threats that you see? Over. Well, uh, Greg, it's a, it's a good question. Um, I would I'd do a couple of things. One is I'd probably, frankly, back off on some of the big conventional um, programs and platforms that, you know, it's not that we don't need aircraft carriers and uh, Virginia class and Columbia class submarines, but I'm just not entirely convinced we need the numbers. We're talking there are huge multi-billion dollar projects. Uh, the new Columbia class nuclear submarines are enormously expensive platforms. So f first of all, I would actually probably reduce some of the, uh, you know, some of the big ticket platforms that we're spending multi-billion dollars on. And where I'd actually focus a, a lot of the investment, to be honest, is probably not in the military or even the intelligence world. It's what we called historically public diplomacy. This is largely a State Department function. Um, I mean, one of the most effective tools that we had during the Cold War was a US information agency. And as part of that, Radio Free Europe and Radio Liberty. And what, it, what they did is recognize how important kind of the, the war of ideas, uh, how, how important that war was. And so, you know, we didn't have to make anything up. We just had, we, what we tried to do is to get information, truthful information into societies that were, that were populations got their information solely from state-run media. And when I look at public diplomacy in the US today, 
we, we don't have, we don't even have any kind of a US information agency. Uh, that budget was doubled during the 1980s. We don't even have it anymore. Radio Free Europe was doubled during the 1980s as well, from 1980 to 1985. Our Global Engagement Center is under-resourced, unimportant strategically. And so, and, and so part of what I'd also do is continue to find ways to help populations in those countries actually technologically be able to to uh, access information coming from outside of their country or even from inside through other means. So providing transparent information and the, the, uh, the, the logic here, and, and you won't get everybody that uh, certainly believes in this, but I, I think we're, from a competitive standpoint, uh, a democratic capitalist open system, most people are gonna want instead of a closed, authoritarian, uh, state-run system. So the more we can help in, the, in those areas, including by pushing information to countries where it's closed and where their countries run their media systems, the better off we are. We're just so poorly behind on that, in that sphere. That's one of the areas where I would definitely put uh, money and resources uh, and where I think we are not well-equipped to compete with those three warfares, for example, that Chinese have.